After nearly three weeks, the court has finally qualified 65 potential jurors in the murder trial of Gregory McMichael, Travis McMichael, and William Roddy Bryan, the three men charged with murdering 25-year-old Ahmad Arbery, who was shot and killed in February of 2020 while jogging through a mostly white community near Brunswick, Georgia. Now to my panel of legal experts to weigh in on today's latest developments, former senior homicide prosecutor Bernarda Villalona, also with us veteran prosecutor and BNC's legal contributor Paul Henderson. Always glad to have you both on. Let's dive right in, shall we? Uh, after a thousand people were summoned to court and after 11 days of questioning, a total of 65 potential jurors have been qualified to serve in the jury pool, which means they get to advance to the final phase of this deselection process. Here's what we know about these prospective jurors. 18 are white men, 33 white women, six black men, and seven black women. Uh, we don't know the ages or occupations of these people, but even if we did, we couldn't say per the judge's order. So thoughts on the racial and gender makeup of this pool. Paul, to you first. Okay, Okay. so this is what I would call a slow burn leading up to it. And then we have sped up suddenly to finally get this pool finally where it's starting to winnow down to reflect the jurors that you just talked about. You know, what I see in here is a wide diversity in the jury that speaks directly to what the defense attorney was talking about yesterday when he was saying that this was not a jury of it, their peers talking about the defendants in this case. And so mm -hmm. I think that the judge was intentional. I think that the prosecution was intentional in trying to have a wide range of jurors to select from to address any challenges that the defense counsel who's trying to plant seeds to overturn whatever conclusion this jury comes to. So that, that's my first reaction to it, that it's much more diverse than I expected they would be able to find for this jury. Much more diverse. Bernardo, what, is your, uh, what are your thoughts? Well, I have to agree, actually, with that comment that it's much more diverse than I thought, because the reason why is because, look, we know that the population in that county is about, what, 84, 85,000 compared to the census from 2020. And out of those numbers, about 69 percent of the population in that county is Caucasian and about 26, 27 percent is African-American. So I'm surprised that they were able to keep so many African-American members members in that jury pool to get us this far. But we'll ultimately see who will make the final 12 plus the four alternates. Well, tomorrow both sides will use court allotted peremptory strikes, which means they get to exclude potential jurors within this group of 65 without a reason or explanation, whittling the number down to 16. Bernarda, each side gets a certain number of strikes, which I believe is eight or nine in Georgia, correct me if I'm wrong, but what could that mean for the three defendants who have to divide those strikes among them equally? So you have to think, so in this case, the judge actually gave them more strikes than actually the law allows for them. So the judge gave each of the defendants eight strikes each, and the prosecution gave them 12 strikes, because I think, I believe, it's usually nine strikes they're entitled to based on the charge in this case. However, looking at those strikes, they're going to have to be very strategic as to how they're going to select the jury out of those 65 people that are in that pool. However, I will say this, they have a benefit. Both sides have a benefit, yo, Deep. How do they have a benefit? It's because they've already questioned each of these potential jury members. So they already get answers. So they can be strategic in terms of X and L. Who do I have to X out in order to jump and get that last juror or get juror number 12? How would I use my strikes in order to get this key juror that I want? So they're going to have to be strategic in that sense to pick the potential jury that they think would be best for their sides. And that's for each side of them. Paul, given how uh, Vordire has unfolded thus far, I predict tomorrow's day of strikes won't go over smoothly. That is correct. And what we will be seeing starting tomorrow is a back and forth with the advocates on both sides, both trying to elicit responses to strike for cause and to try and rehabilit rehabilitate answers from potential jurors for their own benefit. And that's on both sides. So that's going to be happening with a curiosity tomorrow. Um, opening arguments are expected to begin on Thursday. How do you expect the prosecution uh, will lay out the roadmap 
for their case in chief? So, you know, where opening statements have been tried so many cases, you know, that opening statements is your first time when you get to address the actual jury, the actual jury people that were selected. It is the grand opening. So what the prosecution is going to have to do in this case, they're going to have to come out strong. They're going to have to lay out their story, lay out their narrative and lead this jury to the role that they want to lead them to in order to be able to get a conviction in this case. And how do they do that? It's being strategic in terms of how they say things, the words they actually use, the tone that they actually use, and how they lay it out to this jury. Because we're dealing with what? 12 normal people plus the four alternates. So how do you relay your case to 12 regular civilians that you don't know? So they're going to have to come out strong and they're going to have to come out and tell the best story in order to be able to get that conviction at the end. What about the defense? In regards to the defense, so being that there are three defendants, woof, it's going to be a long opening statement because you got to think each one of them <laughs> right. are entitled to give an opening statement. Not that they need to give an opening statement, but you know from everything that we've heard from Willie uh, uh, Ra- Ryan's case, his attorney, that he can talk and he can talk on for days. And actually, he can talk himself actually to a conviction. So I'm curious to see what his opening is going to be like. But in terms of uh, the father and son duo, I would say this that both. Both defense attorneys, they are working together for a common strategic of how they're going to address their case. So it seems that the only person that is out to the side being left out is Kevin Goff's client. So I'm curious to see how they're going to lay everything out. But in regards to the defense, we're still waiting on some rulings because remember that the judge hasn't ruled on whether the Confederate flag license plate is going to be able to come in. So we're still waiting on that ruling because that ruling is going to determine what, how does the defense actually put out their opening statement? How are they going to soften the blow if it does come in? Um, guys, we're following some late breaking developments. Um, BNC's Dre Clark tells us that attorney Kevin Gao, who represents William Roddy Bryan, the one who video recorded Ahmad's killing, informed the court that, that he plans to officially file what he's calling a Bubba complaint in court tomorrow. Paul, we talked about this last night. Gal believes his client is at a disadvantage because the jury pool doesn't have enough white males over 40 without college degrees. Individuals he describes as Bubba's and Joe six packs. Paul, the county is 70%, almost 70% white, not to mention more than half of the jury pool he gets to pick from are white. Your thoughts? We do not care. You don't get to select who you want (laughs) on the jury based on who your defendant is. You know what? because people of color have sat as defendants numerous times without a jury of their peers as determined by race. If you wanna talk about race disparities, sir, I would suggest you look at the race disparities and use of force. I would suggest you look at race disparities and arrest and charging and sentencing. We have a whole list of disparities that I'd like to discuss with you before you march to the front of the line with your commentary and demand that your jury look like your defendant. It's ludicrous and it's offensive. Sir, sit down with your ridiculous arguments that are not based in <laughs> law and pick your jury and get to this guilt. That's what I would say in response. See, peaceful, calm. Bernardo, ha- Bernard, how does the prosecution respond to this? They don't respond because the reality is if you know the law, Bubba's are in a protected class. So if you are in a protected or recognized (laughs) class by the United States Supreme Court, then guess what? Cry me a river. Who are you talking to? That judge is not going to have to read that motion because we know that white males who he's looking for that are not college educated is not a protected class. The Constitution is put there to, to protect the classes in terms of age, race, in terms of religion. That is what the Supreme Court has recognized as a protected class, not the list of bubbas that Goff wants to put forward. Well, Gao also said in court that he's seriously considering filing a motion to sever 
which means separating his client's trial from the trial of the McMichaels, because as it stands, these co-defendants are all being tried together. But the decision to sever a co-defendant's trial is within the sound discretion of the trial court. That news didn't go over so well for Aubrey, uh, Aubrey family attorney, Esley Merritt, who says that this is a tactic by the defense to delay the trial. Now listen, whether it's a delay or not, this is a motion I expected to be filed way before jury selection. Uh, Paul, go. Uh, I think he's filing it at this time in terms of interrupting the jury process. I was expecting this motion to be filed earlier. I don't believe it will be ground granted. I don't believe that he can establish grounds to affirm that his client should be tried separately. You know why? Because he was part of exactly what happened and he should be tried along with the others. There's no valid reason to try his client separately other than the fact that the defendant does not want him associated with the heinous behavior of all of them and to try and get a trial date or a trial separate from what's happening right now. I believe that these motions, I believe that these arguments are dog whistles for uh, racist intents. I believe that they are dog, dog whistles for jury nullification in ways that I hope aren't going to be responded to by the judge in terms of granting any of them. And I presume that we will proceed with the trial in spite of whatever motions this attorney and the other attorneys may be bringing to try and delay, obstruct, or deny having this jury seated and to begin hearing evidence. I would expect more of these types of motions to be brought over the next few days as we are getting closer and closer to having a jury sat for the, sit for this case. All right, the prosecution would argue to keep these trials together for a number of reasons. Give us a few, Bernarda. So one, first off, this motion is a little bit too late. It should have been done way before months ago, before we got to this stage where we're picking a jury. So I don't understand why Goff is just waiting for now to actually either bring this motion or renew this motion. So the prosecution is going to win in this case in terms of keeping the defendants together because number one, judicial economy in terms of it's better to try all three defendants together when you're dealing that it's going to be the same evidence, the same witnesses, and, and the same attorney uh, in terms of the prosecutor that's going to be presenting the case. Second, there are no conflicting statements in terms of the defendant speaking out against another defendant and where you'll have an issue where you're forming a second prosecutor inside of the courtroom. Aside from that, regardless, the judge is going to give this jury instructions. You are to judge each of these defendants individually when you're talking about the charges that are put before them. So in terms of having these defendants separated, it's not going to happen at this point point is just too late regardless it wouldn't have been granted if it was bought before beforehand months ago well there's also been talk of a possible change of venue what are the odds of that happening paul well again timeliness is the issue and we were just talking about that a moment ago with this motion i think the timeliness for change of venue has come and gone because we are in the middle of it right now in short, an absence of an affirmative presentation outlining specific interferences related to the jurisdiction, I think the judge would be hard pressed to grant any sort of motion removing this trial outside of the jurisdiction. And again, just to highlight what we're talking about, the defense attorneys have argued that they have been in their potential influences from scenes outside of the courtroom, from having the family inside the courtroom. But that potential is not evidence. That potential is not measured, and that potential is not interference. And again, it runs in conflict with individuals' First Amendment rights to gather and amendment and the rights that they have to communicate, to rally in however way they want to. And I just don't want to move away from the fact that this was a heinous crime and a murder that people are responding to. And we should expect them to be responding to this, but their responding to this murder and demanding justice is not an interference with this jury. And so I don't see a jurisdictional motion being granted at this time. And I think the trial will continue. This jury will be sat and they will begin hearing evidence. All right, Bernardo Villalona, Paul Henderson, great insight tonight. Thanks to you both.